Welcome to the colloquium. Uh, I'd like to introduce Nayesh Afshrodi. He's from Waterloo and the Perimeter Institute. Nayesh got his uh, undergraduate degree in Tehran in Sharif University, I believe. That's correct, yes. Uh, top institute for physics in, in Iran. Then he moved to Brown for a while and moved to, to Princeton to do his PhD with David Spurgle. Uh, then he moved to Harvard That's right. Uh, as a postdoc and then the Perimeter Institute for, uh, as a postdoc and they liked him enough to offer him a permanent position there so he's partly here and partly here. Uh, and Nayash has always been working and still working on the edge, basically. And places <laughs> that we don't understand, we don't know what to do, so we just send Nayesh there. <laughs> um, and mainly he's work, he's trying to figure out things about quantum gravity. As we all know, gravity and quantum mechanics do not like each other. They don't talk to each other. They kind of pretend that the other one does not exist. And uh, people don't really like that for various good reasons. And I think Nayesh will talk about some of them. And we'll actually try first time ever, uh, well, to connect these things to actual observations. So this is real physics. It's not just philosophy. Mahesh. OK. Thank you very much, Hume, for an introduction. And thank you all for coming and for having me here. I've been having a l very lovely time here in Kansas, in Lawrence. And first, my first time here in the state and the city. So it's, it's, it's been uh, very wonderful. So today, I'm going to tell you about something that's a bit exotic. It's got a little bit of everything, so kind of a fusion topic, if you will. <coughs> and it's, uh, as, as I think the best way, best way uh, uh, to describe it is kind of on the edge. Uh, and there are various edges that you might care about. Um, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer the questions as much as I can. Uh, but uh, there, there are lots of unknown, uh, unanswered questions here. So lots of questions I won't be able to answer. So to go back to the back, uh, to the very beginning, uh, this, my own academic career, I guess you can barely see it here. So it's Unraveling the Darkness. So the, the, the title of my thesis uh, back in 2004, and you cannot read it here, is called The Other 99%. And uh, it was submitted on November 2004. Uh, and I should tell you that this was actually v uh, the, the first work on the other 99%. This was the predecessor to the 99% movement <laughs> that was just to took off in August 2011. So I was the pioneer in, that, in leading that. <laughs> <coughs> But actually, more seriously, I was talking about a slightly different 99% than the one that these, these, these people were concerned with. So uh, the other 99% that I dealt with in my thesis, uh, well, now almost 13, uh, 14 years ago, uh, about 13 years ago now, are, in fact, the other 99% of the cosmos that we fail to see uh, and remain either unidentified or invisible to us, basically mysterious. Now. Uh, there is dark energy, which is most of the uh, most of the energy of the universe. Seventy percent of the energy of the universe, as we know it, and we just discovered it in the past couple of decades. Uh, but it's responsible for acceleration of cosmic expansion. There is dark matter, which is something somewhere around twenty to twenty-five percent of the matter in the universe. We don't we don't understand it very well. Uh, there is basically what happened at the Big Bang out of which dark matter, presumably dark energy, baryons, all the ordinary matter that make us, they came out of the Big Bang, and initial conditions of the universe, the structures that grew to become stars and galaxies and planets that we happen to live in. And uh, another dark component of our universe that might be, you could put it in, within this the other 99% are black holes. Not necessarily in terms of their mass, they don't contribute too much as far as we know to the energy of the universe. Although one possibility for dark matter could be, in fact, black holes. But we know black holes in some form do exist in the universe. We do observe them. This is from the movie Interstellar. But we actually, so this is kind of an artist's conception. But we, there will be images of black holes that look like this over the next two, three years from radio telescopes. Uh, and basically, there are. Uh, 
various mysterious aspects of these things that we don't understand. And part of my job as an astronomer uh, for a long time, when I was a student and uh, as postdoc later on, was to try to observe various phenomena that shed light, uh, observe various phenomena that shed light on nature of these various apparently disparate, uh, uh, disparate processes or disparate objects in the universe. However, uh, one thing that kind of came, became clear to me, or at least uh, seemed like a revelation to me, and it may not be the case, but seemed that it became clear over time, that trying to understand all these various diff very different phenomena may not really be that different after all. And uh, that can remind you of the parable of the elephant. Some of you might have heard about this. This is a bl blind man and an elephant. So there's a idea that there's a dark, dark room there are these blind people who are uh, let into the room and trying to fill different parts of this elephant. Somebody sees, uh, uh, somebody might uh, be touching the, the tail, another per person the body, another person the tusk, another person the, the, the feet. And they all seem to be f touching different things. Could it be that we, these, the, uh, are, we as astronomers and physicists in general, we are actually uh, Various phenomena that we see that appear very, very different, they're really various aspects of the same thing. But you mentioned quantum theory of gravity, and they're just various manifestations of this theory. And at some level, this must be the case, right? I mean, quantum gra theory of gravity, because it's, you don't really have a theory, it's a concept, and it should explain everything if it's there. But it uh, shouldn't be the correct goal, the right goal for us to, uh, to try to connect basically these various dispersed phenomena in one unified framework. And maybe that's the right way to understand all this. So indeed quantum gravity is how we understand, uh, well, you know, quantum mechanics and gravity are how we understand the universe, quantum mechanics on very small scales, gravity on very larger scales. So your iPhone works on quantum mechanics, your GPS works on general relativity, but the rules of quantum mechanics and gravity don't seem to work together. So if you understand that, maybe we can actually understand all these exotic cosmological and astrophysical phenomena. So, so today I'm going to talk about a way of basically uh, relating these different observations. Now, I've worked on connecting Big Bang and dark matter to quantum gravity. I'm not going to talk about those. But that's, there are certainly possibilities that uh, the, the, the certainly both Big Bang, understanding Big Bang and understanding dark matter could be aspects of quantum gravity. Today I'm going to talk about understanding the black holes and dark energy uh, in terms of quantum gravity and how they could be actually related to each other, which is, uh, which is really the, the meat of this talk that it's not just trying to understand ver these various phenomena, but trying to find a connection between these various apparently disparate phenomena that could teach us something about the true nature of the universe. Okay, good. So, so with that introduction, so I'm going to tell you uh, about black holes, what's wrong with the horizons of black holes. I'm going to tell you uh, what horizons could be or what black holes could be. I'm going to tell you what we should look for in, in the sky. And I'm going to tell you about basically the most exciting thing that you may, uh, Hopefully, you're going to take away from this talk uh, what I call echoes from the abyss that uh, you will find out about very soon. So, what are the horizons? So, event horizons are ubiquitous aspects of relativistic physics, uh, as we've known that, learned it over the past 70 or 80 years. So, global structure of some space time in general relativity have event horizons. That means that in classical general relativity, local observers, so in, it, that means that basically some observers, when they cross these horizons, uh, their fate is going to be basically they're going to end up in a singularity, and they can never escape, at least in re general relativity, they cannot escape these horizons. And this is, this is a cartoon of that. This would be a spa time, this would be a space. So if you're outside here, you're safe. But if you happen to cross this imaginary line, uh, then uh, you won't be able to come back. And, uh, and basically, you're going to be able to see things outside for a while, but eventually you're going to fall into the singularity. And that's the only, if you do cross the horizon, that's the only fate that you have according to general relativity. It's an unfortunate fate, but that's the only possible fate you could have. 
And black hole, we know space times where uh, we have very good observational evidence for space times that have this property. This property. Uh, this is kind of an artist impression uh, of a black hole, but there are actually real images uh, uh, that we, we're going to have that kind of look like this, as I said, for, for example, from Event Horizon Telescope. And there are lots of indirect evidence for existence of black hole space times. Uh, and if they do exist, then they must have an event horizon that looks like this. It is according to general relativity. Now, the thing about event horizon and general relativity is that in classical GR, local observers experience no drama as they cross the horizon. That means that if they cross this imaginary line, of course, their fate is sealed. They won't be able to come back, but they won't immediately realize it. And that's one of basically the fundamental features of general relativity, otherwise known as the equivalence principle, that local observers always see Minkowski space, basically, always see rules of a special relativity. And this is MTS space here. Uh, so in MTS space, you always locally experience nothing special. Over time, you will, you will see fall, uh, hitting a singularity. You see tidal effects getting bigger and bigger, otherwise known as spaghettification. But locally, you don't see anything. And that's how you've been taught. If you've ever taken a general relativity course, or if you are teaching a general relativity course, that's what you are learning from your professors or you're teaching your students. But they're probably, I'm pretty sure that's what you, you hear in any general relativity course. Now, there is something mysterious about black holes that they have. Uh, we understand them very well. And something I've discovered by Hawking and other, co other uh, collaborators, and also independently by Jacob Bekenstein, so Bill Unruh, is that black holes have some interesting thermodynamic properties. That if you actually assign a temperature to black holes, and in fact, there are reasons in quantum field theory that they would have a temperature that goes as there's acceleration divided by 2 pi, two pi gravitational acceleration divided by 2 pi. Uh, and you, you assign a, an entropy to the black holes, which is the area of their horizon, divided by 4g. So these are simple. Temperature is acceleration. Entropy is the area. Then you actually uh, seem to obey laws of thermodynamics to every other thermodynamic object that we know. There's a first law of thermodynamics. Uh, DE is TDS plus some other terms that uh, similar to those terms you do have in uh, a standard thermodynamics, so you usually have a PDV term here, minus PDV term in thermodynamics. For black holes, there is no pressure, but there is angular momentum, J, and angular velocity, and there could be a charge and a potential. So they seem to obey thermodynamics, and then there's a second law of thermodynamics that entropy, which is the same as the area of black holes up to a factor, always increases with time. So this has always been a curious thing because uh, when you take a statistical mechanics course or a thermodynamics course, you learn that entropy is, uh, is a way to quantify disorder. <coughs> it's randomness of the system. Or in other words, to be more exact, is the logarithm of the number of microscopic states. How, many, uh, how big is the possible uh, states that the system can occupy? The bigger the entropy, uh, the, entropy the bigger is the number of a random state that a system cannot occupy. But black holes are perfectly simple. They don't seem to have any microstates. They're just sitting there, and they're classical solution to general relativity. So the big question for a very long time has been, which states does this entropy count? So entropy of a black hole, entropy of every other thermodynamic system that we know counts the number of states. But the black holes don't seem to have any state. This is not in classical general relativity. So what does this mean? So that's been a puzzle for a long time. And it's always been thought that this might be actually one of our first clues, one of our clues into the theory of quantum gravity. A, theory of, a consistent theory of quantum gravity should be able to explain uh, where the entropy comes from. There has been more, uh, more things that have been kind of dissatisfying with this classical picture of black holes. And that's known as the information paradox. So, if you have a hot object in empty space, it emits black body radiation or gray body radiation, so it loses energy. And that's what us actually Hawking showed uh, in the 70s. That same would happen for black holes. Black holes lose energy, so eventually should evaporate. But then what happens to the information that fell into the black hole? So the black hole had some initial conditions. Uh, say a star, for example, that collapsed, made a black hole. The black hole, if you wait long enough, it evaporates in empty space. 
What happens to that information? Now, maybe you think it's coming out very, very slowly uh, in the thermal radiation. But in fact, uh, it turns out people have, have done uh, calculations and worked on this for almost 50 years. And it seems that this so-called information paradox doesn't really have any solution. In other words, uh, local physics as you assume in stellar model particle physics, for example, plus a smooth horizon, as general relativity wants us to have, doesn't seem to be consistent with uh, conservation of information, or which is also known as unitarity for, uh, for quantum mechanics. So this is, you may argue, this is actually one of the manifestations of problems that quantum mechanics has with gravity. But it's manifested on much larger scales that you may expect quantum gravity to be important. It's not on a small scales like Planck scales that people usually think about as a scale of quantum gravity. It is on the scale of the horizons of black holes. And I'm going to come back to that. Uh, another aspect which is interesting, and it was, to my knowledge, it was first brought up by Samir Mathur, others might have realized it before, <coughs> is that there is a, there, usually when we think about semi-classical physics, basically quantum fluctuations around a classical background, we always have a perturbative picture in mind. However, we know there are quant uh, quantum aspects of systems that are not perturbative. For example, tunneling. You could have a si very, very well-defined classical trajectory, say like this pointer that's moving, but there is always some probability that tunnels from here somewhere far away, say outside the room. It's not something that's allowed classically, and it's not a small perturbation of a classical uh, background or classical trajectory, but it's something that's allowed under the rules of quantum mechanics. And the probability of that is always exponentially suppressed, exponential of some uh, minus negative uh, number, which is very large. So this SE is a number, so-called Euclidean action is very large and is negative. Or sorry, the minus S, SE is positive and big, minus SE is very small number. So that's usually for big objects is a small. However, it turns out that since black hole has, many, has a large number of microstates, if the entropy of a black hole is real, exponential of number of states you can tunnel to is very big. So the classical black hole, is, it turns out, is unstable to quantum tunneling if you buy this argument. Even though it's big, and then like this chair, or, the, uh, or you and I, the probability of us tunneling to some very, very quantum state is a small. That's only true because we have very small entropy, or the, the, the the kind of things that you, can, you could tunnel to has very small entropy. Black hole, on the other hand, has a very big entropy. And that actually these to exactly cancel each other, it turns out. So if you take the entropy of black hole seriously, then you don't actually take the classical solutions of GR very seriously, because you could tunnel out of this with a probability that could be of order one as soon as you cross the horizon. There is a third argument uh, against the presence of horizons, and that's one uh, that has to do with the existence of dark energy. And that's actually how I got into this business. Now, I was a cosmologist. I told you I did my PhD in cosmology. Uh, and it turns out that there is a simple, uh, although it's not really that simple, but there is, there is a kind of intriguing explanation of dark energy in terms of the physics of black hole horizons. But that requires you to replace horizons by something more exotic that I'm going to get back to in a second. And these are basically chain dependent arguments that they all point to uh, 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 suggest, suggest that maybe horizons are not as we thought in classical general relativity. Now let me get back to firewall paradox. So this is, this is basically the latest incarnation of the black hole information paradox that uh, has grabbed, well, grabbed a lot of attention in the past few years. This came out of a um, Kavl Institute in Santa Barbara uh, by Polchinski and Marov and their students. And of course, Joe Polchinski is a very well-known uh, string theorist. Uh, so if he says something, people take it seriously. And uh, what he said, at least what he signed up to, signed on to, was that there are basically four things that cannot be consistent with each other. And this is a sharpening of uh, the idea of basic information paradox. So the unitarity of quantum mechanics, basically, whether quantum mechanics remain as we know it, as we learned in, uh, uh, from, uh, from our textbooks as an undergrads. 
whether equivalence principle is valid, so that's what Einstein assumed as a principle of general relativity, or otherwise the so-called no drama condition, that if somebody crosses the horizon, doesn't see anything. Whether quantum field theory uh, beyond a Planck link away from the horizon is uh, it's valid, so that's, uh, uh, that's another assumption. So you basically you assume quantum field theory is valid outside the black hole, and that the area of the black hole is in fact the entropy. So the, the Hel Hilbert space of the black hole is exponential of area divided by four, which is basically assuming that entropy of the black hole is really counting the number of states. So these four assumptions, which are commonly assumed, these are the most conservative assumptions for the nature of a black hole, they showed, they argued that they are inconsistent with each other. And they fair, 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 uh, furthermore argued, and this is more subjective, that the most uh, conservative way of saving this is to violate the no drama condition. That's what they call a firewall. Now, whether that's more conservative or not, that's very subjective. Most relativists don't care about quantum mechanics very much, so they can just, they're very happy to let go of unitarity. Uh, I know a string theorists, they don't care about locality very much, so they just can get let, get let go of quantum field theory. Uh, uh, some relativists, uh, like in particular, there's one relativist, Bill Unruh, who doesn't think that the entropy of a black hole is the area, so as they have nothing to do with each other. So different people have different choices. However, uh, at least something that they argued, and uh, I think it's, uh, sir, sir, I, th I, I seem to, I also agree with that, is that it, it probably makes much more sense to get rid of the so-called no drama condition. That means that the horizon, something special happens at the horizon. Okay, yes? Yeah, a quick question. No two of them uh, are consistent. No, the, the four of them, they are not all co uh, consistent together. So if you let one of them go, then they could be consistent, right? The question, which one do you want to let go? And different people have different favorite, favorite ones. So they argue that the most conservative is to let go of this, of this. That means that you replace horizon with something special. And what they mean by firewall is that basically if an observer crosses the horizon, it, he or she would lose all the information or quote unquote burn, basically. So something special happens at the horizon. And there is basically nothing, like, no, non classical description inside the horizon or as you cross the horizon. So, so this is an intriguing story. But okay, so if you decide to basically drink a Kool Aid and decide and let go of the horizon, what should you replace the horizon with? Now, there is one possibility, also due to Samir Masur, and he calls it fuzzball. So these are classical horizonless solutions, horizonless space times, that could account for black hole entropy. Now these are kind of exotic solutions that come out of supergravity. They have higher dimensions that need to be compactified in, in a way. So they're, they're, the construction is very technical. But the claim is that there have lots, you have lots of them, and if you count them properly, it actually accounts for black hole entropy. So that's known as the fuzzball paradigm. And uh, so that's, that certainly has been one of the possibilities. Another possibility, which is not necessarily distinct, but it's one that I, I worked on, and you could think of it as like a classical version of the fuzzballs, is what I call ether holes. Uh, and these are basically holes in space time which uh, have uh, a membrane, basically uh, the, the, your, your, the idea is that the space time has a hole, there is nothing inside of it. You, you put a membrane on the boundary with the mirror symmetry, and it turns out that you could, you could do basically simple calculations, I'm gonna argue in a second, you can recover black hole entropy, and you can actually explain the, the, the magnitude of dark energy, which is kind of what's attract, interact, well, attractive about this. There are other possibilities that I don't find as attractive, so you don't hear me talk about them very much. But, uh, but there are certainly also other, other things that could, you could replace horizon with. So the so-called gravis stars, two, two holes, Planck stars, and the list continues. So this has been kind of the, one of the pet, pet hobbies of theorists over the past, uh, I would say, 40 years. <laughs> uh, well, 30 years maybe to come up with different things that replace black holes. But uh, I'm going to 
try to advocate basically this, this kind of these two pictures, the uh, fuzzballs and ether holes. And I'm going to advocate basically fuzz, uh, uh, them as being this really different uh, sides of the same coin. And that might be actually a way to think about what's happening at the horizons of black holes. And the reason I think, as Hugh mentioned, it's science is that you could actually make predictions and hope to see them in the data. And maybe we do see them in the data. So let me just tell you what, uh, and this is a little bit technical. Uh, actually, the last couple of our slide is going to be a little bit technical. So uh, this for those, who, those of you who care about the technical details, uh, and hopefully the rest of you bear with me. Uh, so the idea, and this is something that kind of my, my student discovered, Mehdi Saravani, who is a postdoc now in Nottingham. Uh, it's a very counterintuitive one. If you do what I told you, if I just take the space time of black hole, put a membrane, Around, around the black hole and get rid of the, uh, what's inside. And assume that you have mirror symmetry. Um, uh, you could use something called Israel junction condition, which is basically a, a version of the Einstein equations and the mirror symmetry to show that this membrane should have zero, almost zero surface density. There is a surface pressure on the membrane, which happens to be one quarter of the black hole temperature. And you can calculate the entropy of this membrane which is, happens to be basically the pressure divided by temperature and is exactly one quarter, which is exactly basically the, the number that Hawking and uh, Bekenstein got in the 70s. And the, 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 the interpretation is that those microstates that we were talking about are just basically tem thermal degrees of freedom on the membrane. So that's good, but then we just recovered the no results, so maybe it's not that exciting. But there's a physical picture that goes with this, is that there's no horizon, but rather all the degrees of freedom sit just outside the horizon, maybe within a Planck length of the horizon. Uh, so if there's no horizon, then maybe there's something that we can probe about quantum gravity sitting right, right out there, uh, just near to where a horizon would have been. The most surprising thing out of this was if you ask that you could, you could explain dark energy in a very non-trivial way, and I was basically assuming that if you have a fluid with some pressure that sits around the black hole, uh, you can actually solve for a space-time and compute the space-time structure, what you will realize is that you get deviations from a general relativity that blow up very close to the horizon at an infinity. So that's basically how they look like. The, the deviation from general relativity blow up at infinity or become very large at infinity and very close to the horizon. And actually, there is the same amplitude with the pressure of dark energy or pressure of the fluid at infinity that uh, basically controls the whole, the whole deviation. There are no horizons. And what you find is that the redshift is finite. At our, so these are kind of technical details. The most surprising thing is that if you assume that basically these deviations become order one within the Planck length of the horizon, you get a value for this pressure. And if you pl plug in the number, it's basically the same value as the pressure of dark energy that we observe for the masses of the black hole that we know exist in the universe. Within, so within, a, a order of within an order of magnitude two, given that we don't exact, there are, there are uh, factors of order, order one that goes in here. So this was very surprising. You, you don't even get the right sign, you get the negative pressure for this. This is very surprising. And it connects the cosmology on very larger scales to the structure of the horizon on very small scales, which, again, very non-trivial, but seems that everything would fit together so you could understand the horizons and dark energy at the same time if this picture holds. So uh, another interesting, uh, one of the cor corollaries of this is that if, the ma if F dark energy really depends on the mass of the black holes, if the mass of black holes changes over time, then dark energy should change over time. And this is something we did with my colleague Michael Ballow and my first student, Chandra Prescott Weinstein, where we looked at different uh, mean black hole mass histories in various astrophysical scenarios, how they evolved with time, and what it implies for the evolution of dark energy over time which some of them were, was ruled out by data, some were not. The main problem here, of course, is that we don't exactly understand the astrophysics of galaxy formation, how black holes grow over time, supermassive black holes and stellar black holes. So that's a still an uncertainty, but that's one that hopefully will be uh, pinned down over time. But that's, 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 that's very exciting. So, 
But is that it? Is that the only possibility? Could there be other things? Uh, before I move on, let me ask, are there any questions? OK, so yes. Uh, you lost me at the mm. point where I got the impression that yeah. what had been the unreachable black hole yes. material is no longer space-time. Right. So, that. That's right. So, so All the effects mm -hmm. that we think of as black hole are on the boundary. Right, so there, there are two pieces, of, uh, two pieces of the puzzle here. One is that we're saying that the horizon, so it used to be all the space time and nothing else, but we're saying that's inconsistent with quantum mechanics. So what we did is we replaced basically the horizon and everything inside of it with a membrane. And in fact, that's kind of what you get from this fuzzball picture. It seems that basically uh, all these uh, string theory solutions, they're all out far away, they look the same. But as you approach the horizon, you, you don't see a horizon. You see basically lots of fluctuations. So we, we call all of that a membrane, a quote unquote membrane. So that's a step one. So outside, empty space, just outside the horizon or around the horizon, you have a stuff that's sitting there, exotic stuff, call it a membrane. That's a step one. The step two, which is in, intriguing because it's connected to dark energy, says that maybe that stuff or uh, something actually is not just limited to this membrane, but could actually leak outside, a but just a little bit. And that's the dark energy fluid. And what I showed is that if you assume that everything is in equilibrium, so the so-called dark energy fluid is in equilibrium with, uh, with the membrane, which sits, say, Planck length outside the horizon, then you get the right pressure for the dark energy. Now, yeah, I, a priori, maybe you wouldn't have predicted that this dark energy would have been there, but now we know there is dark energy. And of course, the big mystery is why is it what it is? And it turns out that, uh, so it happens that this calculation I, I told you gives you the right pressure for the dark energy. So uh, that's interesting, but okay. So is there any other way that we could see, I mean, we could make sure, maybe if we see the evolution of dark energy, I mean, there are some tentative hints that we are already seeing the evolution of dark energy. Maybe that's, that's already a, a way to test this. But uh, as I said, the main problem is we don't know how black holes evolve over cosmic history. So that's, that's still uh, uncertain. So there are other things you could look for. So fuzzball or fireball phenomenology. So if you just say that you don't have horizons, you have exotic stuff sitting outside the horizon, you may hope to see signals. So uh, Avery Broderick and company, they talked about radio or infrared signals that you might see. If there's, say, a thermal, a thermal surface, or surface in thermal equilibrium, basically the idea is that if there's accretion into black holes, for example, black hole, supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, then, um, then there could be emission. If you think see the surface, they could get hot and then emit light. So they looked for it and didn't see anything. So that's a possible signal. Uh, there is possibility of pulsar timing. If you ever see millisecond pulsars very near the black hole at the center of the galaxy, we might be able to see quantum effects. So that's a possibility. Depends on how close those pulsars get to the black hole. Uh, one, one possibility that I explored with my uh, now former PhD student, Yasman Yazdi, who is a postdoc at the University of Alberta now, uh, is looking at neutrinos, maybe ultra high energy neutrinos that has been observed by the ice cube. So this is kind of the data from ice cube, the, the, the bow tie that you see here. And currently we don't really have a good explanation for where, where these ultra high energy neutrinos come from. So these are kind of the best fit or the best fit models, not the best fit models, like the proposed models from active galactic nuclear or from gamma ray bursts. None of them quite fit the shape of the spectrum of uh, ice cube neutrinos. So our proposal was that maybe uh, actually the way you make these ultra high energy neutrinos is that because neutrinos are very weakly interacting, they could be trapped between uh, some sort of accretion flow and the fuzzball or firewalls. They kind of keep bouncing back and forth between the fireball and accretion flow. And then through some version of the so-called Fermi acceleration, uh, but through gravitational Fermi acceleration, not the standard one, which relies on magnetic fields, you could get, make a parallel spectrum of neutrinos. Now, that sounds exotic, but that's the realm that we are working on. And that does fits basically the data 
if you say around 5% of the energy that are accreted in the black holes comes out as these neutrinos. Is that Sorry, yes. Yeah. Is that you don't have the citation. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you could, you could look at that, but it's, I mean, I, I didn't put the full citation for everything, yeah. Yes. So when you said hints of dark energy evolving when the equation of state is changing with time? Yes. Okay, and those come from what measurements? Because they're not. Uh, the, so there were hints of it, I just didn't know. Oh, no, so, so there is, uh, but, but I, I didn't show it, but there, there are hints that there is this discrepancy between local measurements of the Hubble constant, oh, okay. yes, and the cosmological one. And, uh, yeah. and the second thing is the evolution that you expect from stellar mass black holes is that just the number of these is changing with time? And so that's uh, right, so the calculation that we did is basically you, you have to do some version of averaging. So there's supermassive black holes and a stellar black, ma black mass black holes, but the relative ratio of the two changes over time. And that's, at least in that calculation that we did, that's what drove the change. That basically you had less mass in supermassive black holes and you get more mass in supermassive black holes over time because things keep accreting into them. So, uh, but I mean, there, there could be various things that are happening, and I mean, we didn't really model all of that. And other things that metallicity changes over time, so that could change the preferred mass of the stellar black holes. So yeah, so I think that's, a, that's just a very complicated and rich phenomenology there that hasn't been really explored, yeah. Good, other questions? Okay. Wonderful. So uh, now, this is just a possibility. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not going to push for it too, too hard. Uh, there could be other astrophysics that's responsible for uh, ultra high energy neutrinos. It's just we haven't been able to come up with one yet. And now there was the Nobel Prize that was announced two, uh, two weeks ago. Now, was it two weeks ago or one week ago? So well, I guess it was two weeks ago. Uh, <coughs> awarded to keep turn. Ray Weiss and Barry Barish, who for the first time detected gravity, uh, that led the LIGO collaboration that detected gravitational waves from mergers of black holes. Now, these are also black holes. And if there's exotic physics, can we hope to see that in the signal that LIGO collaboration discovered? And indeed, this is, uh, this is a, uh, the new era for astronomy and hopefully maybe for fundamental physics because we see we have a new way of probing the universe see, can, that can see deeper into things than anything else that we, we had. Gravitational waves interact very, very weakly with matter. So they could probe as far back to the Big Bang as they, as they go and they can probe as far into the black holes or dense things as they can go. Now, uh, some of you might have followed the excitement that last week uh, there was a detection of the first electromagnetic follow-up of a gravitational wave, in, uh, a gravitational wave in, uh, event, presumably due to mergers of neutron stars. That was very exciting. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, we certainly learned a lot about physics of neutron stars and gamma ray bursts from that observations. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, slightly older observations from 2016 by LIGO collaboration, which was mergers of two big black holes, uh, 30 solar mass black holes, roughly. And that was a big surprise, because really nobody expected black holes in that range. They did, nobody ruled it out, but that's much bigger black holes than any black holes we actually have seen in astrophysics. No, a stellar black holes we've seen in astrophysics. Supermassive black holes are much bigger masses that have been seen, but they're not expected to be observed by LIGO. And the signal we've seen, so this is, this is how they look like, if you haven't already seen it. Um, this are two different detectors. If you overlay them with a time delay, the de detector is one is in Louisiana, the other is in Washington. The signal basically la uh, lay, uh, lays on top of each other, lie on top of each other, and the reason for that is, uh, well, it would be very surprising because they have uncorrelated noise. So it's very suggestive that it's real signal. And that, the other reason is that it fits very well to theoretical predictions that you could see these are the best fit models uh, from mergers of two black holes from general relativity. So that was a big deal, huge discovery, and uh, very deservedly it won the Nobel Prize uh, for this year. Uh, and it tells us something else. It tells us about whether horizons exist for black holes or not. Now, the fact that this prediction matches so well with observations, in fact, LIGO collaboration interpreted this as evidence for event horizons of black holes, but that was disputed very quickly. 
and uh, the reason for that is um, if you have something like a fuzzball uh, or a firewall, so the, the things that are at high energy is, much, energy is much bigger than the Hawking, uh, Hawking temperature, they would be absorbed by the black hole, so you wouldn't see them, uh, because they could excite the degrees of freedom of the firewall or the fuzzball. The particles at energy is much less than KT, uh, the, the Hawking temperature or Hawking photons. They could be reflected. So that's the kind of thing we could look for. And in fact, uh, the, the LIGO frequency is right ar ar around the right frequency to see the signal. So this is the, the Hawking temperature divided by the Planck constant. This is, these are the frequencies that are observed by LIGO collaboration as a function of time. So the frequency is right, but what should we see? And that's, uh, that's the next part. So the nice thing about the black holes is that so we, we have all the parameters of these black holes. So these are actually three events. There are, there are a couple more events now that are also not quite as good as this blue one, but better than uh, these two other ones. Uh, so I haven't added those. But basically, we see these black hole measure events. The, and if we measure the, the spin, so this is the spin of the final product, and this is the mass of the final product. So we know these very well. So for example, the biggest event, the mass is around 60 something. Uh, you could read it up here somewhere. Uh, 62 solar masses. And a spin is around 0.7 of maximum a spin that you could have. You could actually predict the signal you would have if you, you put something close to the horizon. And it turns out the kind of signal you see are these so-called echoes, what I call echoes from the abyss. The reason for that is that if you have something that basically signal that reaches within the Planck length of the horizon and comes back, if it, if the time it takes to reach horizon is infinite in classical general relativity. However, if you want to reach within the Planck length of the horizon and come back, that time is not, it's, it's big, but it's not quite infinite. It's only logarithmically big. So the time is basically eight times the mass of the black hole, at least for a non-spinning black hole, Times, uh, times a log of, uh, natural log of mass of the black hole divided by the Planck mass. So this log is something of order of 100. So you expect basically to see some signal which is delayed from the main event, but not by long. So the main event that you saw was, uh, you see here, this is time in, uh, well, this doesn't show time very well. Uh, so you see like it says, uh, the, the main event is around point, 0.05 second, right? So this, this range is 0.05 second, 5% 5 of a second. And you can calculate the, the time for the echoes uh, to see these basic so-called echoes if t things reach the horizon and come back, or reach the fireball and come back is around 0.3 seconds. So it's around uh, a factor of few, roughly 10 times longer than the time scale of uh, the merger itself. And, uh, you could, uh, and the picture is that you're not going to see a single one. You're going to see a series of echoes. Because what happens is that the black hole signal, um, if, if, you didn't have, uh, if you didn't have the firewall, basically things would either fall into a black hole or go to infinity. But what happens is that you have the so-called angular momentum barrier. Basically, this is the, the place where things differ outside of them. They escape to infinity. They are inside. Uh, they're more likely to fall in. This is known as the photon radius. This is three times the Schwarzschild radius. Sorry, three times the mass of the black hole, one and a half times Schwarzschild radius. And things can actually get trapped within this uh, firewall uh, and the angular momentum barrier. So you, it's like an echo chamber. Literally, this is what it is. It's an echo chamber. Things can go back and forth. And every time you hit the angular momentum barrier, a little bit comes out. This is, uh, the, you would, then you expect to see these echoes. And this is actually something we. It's called a black hole ecology, uh, which my student, Tsing Wang is working on. And so this is basically a predicted signal. This is a signal that LIGO sees, and these are the echoes. Depending on how, how close you put the membrane from where the horizon would have been. So if it's a Planck length, it would be the gray. Uh, if, you see 100, if you have 100 Planck length, it would be the red, and blue is 
the th 10,000 times Planck length. So depending on exactly where you put the membrane, you would see the echoes that are delayed. The closer you are to the horizon, the longer is the delay of the echo. So the gray ones are later than all the other ones. And the shape of the echoes, so you can solve basically linear uh, generativistic equations, the shape of the echoes actually are different. The earlier echo, so it's the second echo, uh, is this red thing here. It's more compact, but the later echoes are kind of uh, spread longer over time. So the, they are weaker and uh, spread longer over time. So we actually went out and looked for these echoes. And this is the work uh, primarily done with Jahid Abedi, who's a PhD student in Sharif, and Hannah Dicker, who was an undergraduate visiting us uh, back in Waterloo. And we basically made a phenomenological template, you don't have to worry about the details, for these echoes, and then looked at the data that was publicly released by LIGO, and see basically within these time scales that are predicted from LIGO uh, observations, and assuming a plank, Planckian membrane, do you see any signal at this time scale, or any signature of these echoes? So just before I show you the results, I want to, uh, for those of you who don't deal with data very much on a daily basis, there's this thing called signal to noise ratio. And if you have a good model, it maximizes the signal to noise ratio. If you have a bad model, you don't, you don't get a high signal to noise ratio. And basically, usually to find, finding for the best fit model involves maximizing the signal to noise ratio. And this thing in, uh, has a model in it, has the data in it, and it has error in it. But if you, get, if you maximize it, that means that you get a, a, the best fit model. The bigger it is, the better your model fits the data. And here is the data. So this is the best fit signal to noise ratio squared as a function of time. And one is when we predicted to see the echoes. And we marginalize over all the unknown parameters. And what you see is that the maximum happens to be exactly at one within 5%, within actually 5%. This peak is at uh, 1.05. And there is an uncertainty on exactly where you expect to see this, but for uh, reasons that we don't have a nonlinear simulation of all this happening, involving the echoes. And that's around 1%. So those are the, the dotted lines here. And the uh, what you see is that you see a peak here, and it's bigger than every other peak if you combine all the events. And the probability of having this peak being as big as it is, is basically uh, uh, less than 1%. In other words, yeah, so basically all the random, no if you just generated this data from random noise uh, and look at everything that you see inside this window, the probability of going above this is less than 1%. But I have a question about that. I mean, you have all these other peaks that are almost as high. And you're well, yep. Than your actual peaks. So is there Absolutely. A prior, is there a prior on that? Echo right, so there is a hypothesis that we're testing that basically the hypothesis is that there is a, um, there's a membrane within the Planck length of the horizon. Now, uh, th and that would predict that there should be an echo seen at one basically by definition. And that always matters. Like, so so the, the significance of your finding depends on your prior. So if we said this wasn't a, within a Planck length, but it could basically have a much bigger uh, range, then of course, uh, all of these other ones would be allowed as well, and you have a much lower significance. So the question is that how much uh, you trust your hypothesis. And the hypothesis that we tested was basically things within the Planck length of the horizon. And the probability of that is basically the confidence is larger than 99%, which is not too impressive. It's, I mean, if you convert it to sigma, it's 2.5 sigma, depending on exactly how you define it. But it's basically roughly 2.5 sigma. I guess I can ask another question, which is how often would you find a peak like that by chance, given that there are many other peaks that almost equal? That's the number, right? That's the number. So it, another way of seeing it is that uh, this is the highest peak that you have in this range. And there are about 100 of intervals of this size in this range. So the probability of the highest peak uh, in this range to be in the place where we predict it to be, just by random chance, is 1%. That's not how we calculated this, but uh, that's the way, one way to see that's where 1% comes from. Right. So if we didn't know where the peak should have been, then uh, this wouldn't be particularly impressive. But the fact that we actually know where the peak should be, that does make it more impressive. Right. Now, and again, it's, it's still not, not five sigma. 
then that's going to change because there will be more better data coming in, at least over the next few years, if not, uh, well, if not decades. <laughs> but the idea is that this was really basically the first, the first run of LIGO. Uh, there was another run, and unfortunately, none of the events that they saw was quite as impressive or as big as this, the, the first event that they saw. But there will be more events that will be seen, and there will be more data that will be public. So hopefully, either this significance would go up or down. So we, we've done this analysis for one of the events that has been released uh, back in January. And we still see a peak at the same point, but it's not quite as impressive. Um, because basically, that event wasn't quite as significant. So it's not, it's not quite clear. So conclusions, and this doesn't come up very well, but these are the same. Uh, the same people trying to fill the elephant from various parts. Uh, the question is, can we really put, the, put back these pieces of the puzzle? And uh, so I think, I, I hopefully, I try to convince you, or have, I managed to convince you that there are strong motivations for alternatives to black hole horizons. This comes from black hole information paradox. It comes from quantum tunneling. And it also comes from uh, the observation of dark energy. And they're all kind of the context dependent, and not everybody agrees on all of them, but they are very different pieces of evidence, or lines of arguments, if you will. And these are all theoretical arguments. Well, I mean, dark energy, I guess, is not theoretical, but there is also, I guess, obviously, we've detected dark energy now. Now, as, a, as, as is clear, you have to take it with a grain of salt, but there is, might be tentative evidence somewhere between two, three, two to three sigma uh, for echoes in for echoes from Planck scalar structure, and that's the st exact statement. There is a hypothesis that we test for, and that's confirmed that they're at basically fault detection probability less than one percent. Again, that's a long way from five sigma, but hopefully, if we, if your data increases, we can we can get there over time, or if the sensitivity or the number of detections increases. So could it be confirmed either ether holes, fuzzballs, firewalls, or other possibilities for, uh, for alternatives for black holes? We don't, we're not quite sure. But again, that's, that's, some, that's on the to-do list. So what's next? Uh, so we're going to have an independent confirmation, hopefully. And the LIGO team reproduced the same analysis that we did. But again, we, they, it's not quite so overwhelming, because it's, it's, it's a word there. They find around 3% instead of 1%. But other than that, basically, they reproduce the same analysis. Uh, there will be more events. There have been already some events, but not quite as significant. So, oh, but over time, independent events, if they also see the same signal, then that becomes more encouraging, suggests that it may not be noise. And then I think the most important thing is having a more physical echo template, because if we know what we're looking for, then uh, you could, you could uh, be more decisive about what, what we're seeing, and then basically you can decrease the backgrounds. Right now we have, in some sense, too many free parameters, and our template for the echoes, the thing that we look for, is very phenomenological. But hopefully we can make that more physical, and that could, if echoes are real, that could increase the significance. If they're not real, then it's not going to do anything, or it's going to decrease the significance. So, so that's also on the to-do list. In fact, we already have as, as some upcoming work on this. And in fact, we are organizing a workshop in three weeks at Perimeter on this, quantum black holes in the sky. Um, so if, if you are interested in this topic, you could follow the talks. They will be all recorded uh, at this link. Uh, and it's, this is just coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, so, and so this is going to bring theorists and observers and see whether basically we can reach a common ground and a roadmap for what to do next. And I guess I'm going to leave you with this. Let's see now. Yes, so this is, uh, this is with my students who I guess we worked on observing uh, firewalls. Right. OK, thank you. So again, for this, the black hole ratio between supermassive black holes and stellar flats, black holes explaining yes. dissolving dark energy. And we don't really know well how fast the supermassive black how the supermassive Absolutely, black yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nor the relative growth of right. mass, in the absolutely, mass, especially at early times. Yeah. So, 
So you just build a framework to say if for a given yeah. set of yeah, no, I didn't. I did. I, I don't think I, I. I didn't mean to imply that there's evidence for this scenario. If uh, I mean based on the data we have, all I said is that there there might be some evidence that dark energy is evolving uh, based on uh, I guess this discrepancy between the local measurements and, and I guess CMB measurements of the Hubble. Uh, now I think there is a big to-do list, and this is not. It, it hasn't been for the lack of trying. But it, it turns out that uh, it is a very hard problem to, to, to well, I mean, uh, the astrophysics is very hard, but also the modeling is very hard for how. Uh, so what we did was very rudimentary in terms of how basic dark energy depends on the mass distribution of black holes. But it, it's a hard problem. And so, uh, so that's, that's the to-do list, but it's, 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 a hard, it's a hard problem on astrophysics and on, on the physics, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you had where the SNR was the metric that you used to make that. Plot. That's right. How did you just decide on that particular metric? What, what would you have used? I don't know. I mean, something that could maybe reduce the backgrounds a little more. I mean, was it like a template matching kind of thing? It is a template matching, right? Template yeah. No, it's not the best thing. I mean, the other thing you could use is Bayesian evidence. Uh, which, I mean, the, the idea is that this is a little bit of a technical question about what is that. So the idea, if you have a big enough signal, you should see it no matter what, what method you use. But if you don't have a big enough signal, then the answer to, that you get might depend on the details of the analysis. And that's kind of, uh, that's the way it is, right? And it, this is actually most clarified or crystallized in the Bayesian framework because there is a prior. And it's quite arbitrary what prior you have to use to do an analysis. And we, I mean, the same in, in, any, in calculation of Bayesian evidence, it come up, comes up. And in what we, does, what we did as well, it, uh, and what we, we, we did, uh, with what we do, it does come up that there are some arbitrary components. Now, the SNR thing is the thing that's, I mean, most immediately available in the LIGO, uh, PSK. LIGO team, and the thing that you could do the fastest, to maximize, calculate it and maximize it. And I think in some sense is the most intuitive thing, at least from my point of view, because, um, right, basically SNR, signal to noise ratio tells you how well your model fits the data. Right. So that's, uh, that's kind of what, I guess you could say it's the frequentest thing to, to quote. Uh, so then that's, that's, and I'm, I hate to say it because apparently, no, I've never heard anybody say that they're frequentists because I think that's a very bad. I have, people have been proud of saying that they're Bayesian, but I've never said, seen anybody who's proud of being a frequentist. So I guess I'm an, I'm an embarrassed frequentist, if you will, <laughs> just because it seems that it's more intuitive to think about it. So, so in the figure where you showed the, the, the echoes from the abyss, there yeah. two curves. One is combined events. And that's right. That's right. Was that particular event included in the combined event? That's right, it is. It's, yeah. So it turns out that if you, you, you cannot the event do the event separately. And um, our idea, I mean, you could do it, but you just don't get anything. I just get noise. Uh, and our under, at least our theory for that is that there is a degeneracy between basically parameters. And the different events uh, probe different parts of the uh, template. So individual events on their own, there is no detection because basically they cannot. Uh, uh, because there's degeneracy between the amplitude and other parameters in the echo. So you have to combine them to actually, so, so this one, this is the most significant event. Right? So this is, this is by far the most significant event that's been for, seen in LIGO, except for the neutron star event, but the most significant black hole merger event. So it does seem to, I mean, the probability of this is around 10%, uh, so it's not uh, very overwhelming. There is a still a peak here. If you combine them, it becomes much more interesting and basically, we are, our argument is that uh, you are breaking the degeneracies when you combine the events. But is it, is it fair to say that that event is inconsistent with the combined picture? Why do you say it's inconsistent? Well, the largest peak is not at 1. The, they are at the same place. They're both at 1.05. Yeah, uh, this one. Right. But that could be just noise. Right. But um, my only point is that the, yeah. the, there's a well-known effect for example, if you combine, say, Gaussian measurements of right. things that are inconsistent, the combined confidence interval will often, particularly in a frequentist case, be artificially much smaller than it actually is when you're combining inconsistent measurements. Mm -hmm. The question is, is this feature evidence of some 
echo of a coincidence between the ensemble of measurements mm. is actually any individual measurement consistent with the That's a very good question. No, I think that's, that, that, that's, 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 that's a very good question. So our, our, our argument, is, so there, is, there are two, two things. This is how well you can measure the parameters. And the other is, uh, is, this a special, is this noise or not? And I think we are really at the first part, that is this noise or not? And I think the argument we have is that if it's, no, if it's noise, if you look at enough random data, you should see something like this, right? And that's, that's basically our, our main kind of our clear argument is that just look at random data. Do you see something like this or not? And that's, what, that's how we get this 90%. Basically, this, the, the, the data, so this is a very special place. This, uh, it's like around 5% uh, of a second. The LIGO data is for an hour. So you could basically, there's lots of random places you could look and see okay, how often you see something as this big. And I, basically, 1% of the time, you see that. Now, whether these different events are consistent with each other or not, that's a very good question. And uh, I think basically we're not really there to say. I mean, that, uh, yeah, that would be overinterpreting the data. I, yeah. I guess my, along the same lines, my question would be, what is sufficiently consistent with one to be compelling in this plot? Well, we, very small interval drawn around one. Right. How would that interval show? Right, so if you say it's 1%, now whether it's 1% or 2% or 0.5%, it's, it's hard to know. It has, it's basically a reflection of the fact that nonlinear, um, uh, everything that goes into this calculation is linear, but we know black hole mergers is nonlinear. So it actually has to do with the fact that um, if you think about as this as a black hole, this looks funny. If you think of this as a black hole merger, uh, exactly where the merger happens, it really involves a nonlinear simulation. And basically, this time scale for the basic event, the e you see the echo from the merger event, that uh, you cannot fully say that from linear theory. It involves nonlinear calculus. And that's, that's around the percent uncertainty. Basically, this kind of phase, shifting the phase by like 180 degrees, shifting things by one period, that would change things by percent. That's the uncertainty. Now, if it was 2%, then of course, it would have been worse. If it was 0.5%, 0.5%, it would have been better. But yeah, so that's, that's the kind of uncertainty that we don't exactly have under control. And really, the only way to do that is to have a nonlinear simulation that has echoes in it, not just nonlinear simulation of black hole mergers, one that actually has echoes. And that's something that I hope to do, but that's the very tall order. I mean, we already managed to do have mergers of black holes only in the past two, I mean, 15 years, really if you have mergers of black holes in numerical relativity. Now, to have the membranes added into them, I think um, it's hard, and we don't quite know what is the right way of doing it. OK, let's thank. Uh... <laughs>